material, and they do believe that it is useful to the investigation. Lou? Eileen O'Connor following the investigation, which proceeds apace in Washington and elsewhere, Coral Springs, Florida, and uh, Boston, Massachusetts, where uh, two of the airliners uh, that were hijacked uh, and involved in yesterday's uh, terrorist hijacking uh, were from. Okay, Natalie, it's now up to you. Lou, we've just learned there will be an FBI news conference at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll, of course, provide live coverage, and perhaps they will provide more information about the information we're giving you today from Eileen O'Connor and elsewhere in Washington and Boston, and now to hear about the investigation spreading to Florida. We hope to get more information from the FBI in just one hour. And again, Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, will be coming before the cameras in just 30 minutes. Right now, we want to talk with Frank Lucier, who is with the North American Emergency Management. Uh, Mr. Lucier's uh, firm specializes in emergency and disaster planning, and we know that you teach rescue skills, and we thank you for being with us. Thank you. I want to talk to you first about the scenes that we are witnessing in New York. I don't know if you saw a few moments ago, we had video from the doctor who went in yesterday right after these planes hit the World Trade Center towers. And he was there in the thick of things when this happened, the towers collapsed, and you could see the aftermath of that. Many of us can't begin to comprehend what it's like to be in there, but perhaps you can give us a sense, as we see these pictures from uh, Dr. Heath, of what these people are dealing with. Well, it's, it's definitely unprecedented. If you compare this to the Oklahoma City bombing, the, uh, the Miura federal, federal building was uh, nine stories high, it was 200 feet wide, and the rubble pile that ended up was about 35 feet high, that it took 11 search and rescue teams, uh, 14 days working round the clock to get all the victims out. And we're talking about two towers, 110 feet high, a couple of other buildings, one other building. Uh, it's, it's an undaunting task. Right. Uh, they describe the rubble being it's five to six stories high in some places. How do you go about it at this point when you don't know what is stable and what isn't? We've heard the descriptions of the soot in the air. There may be a problem with asbestos in New York City now. People can hardly breathe in that area. Uh, we just saw pictures of dogs. Where do they go from here, Mr. Lassier? Well. The first thing you have to do is, is extinguish the fire so that they can get to the locations. Uh, and then there are techniques using listening devices and search dogs, and I know there's some search robots they're using to find if uh, any signs of life to people in, in, in that rubble pile. Once they find that, it can be the area that they're, they're directing the surge can be stabilized using shoring and other techniques so they can tunnel down to the victims, hopefully, hopefully and extricate them. How difficult is it to be able to detect where these pockets might be? We know that several firefighters were pulled out early this morning that were in a pocket, so debris did not fall directly on them. Uh, it's, it's impossible from the exterior to, to identify where these pockets are. You really have to uh, depend on the technology that's available, both uh, technology and the dogs, to, to find people that are tapping on something or, or screaming or calling out, whatever. That noise uh, can be identified with these listening devices and uh, those pockets can be identified where they are. And certainly cell phones have come into play in this horrible tragedy from people calling from the telephones and uh, there have been a couple calls from the rubble. We have heard that this could take weeks, if not months, to sort through all of this rubble. From what you're seeing, um, is, is it impossible to tell? Well, it, it, it's impossible to give you uh, an exact timeline, that's for sure. It's, it's still a crime scene, so it has to be treated as such. Uh, but it, 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 well, like I said at the beginning, it took 14 days. It took uh, 11 USAR teams 14 days working around the clock just to search the uh, Mira building in, in Oklahoma City. So we're looking at at least that amount of time, if not a lot more for this. And finally, it's one thing to train to search and do a technical search. It's another to deal with 
just the emotional element of being at such a scene of a devastation. How do these officials train to handle what they are seeing and experiencing? Uh, you, you, can't, you can't simulate uh, what just happened. Uh, the, the fire service, the emergency responders uh, know that they have a job to do. There is a potential for, for saving lives and that's what they do every day. So uh, they will deal with the emotions uh, as an ongoing process and at the end of this rather than right now. Frank Lucier, we thank you for being with us. We know you were about to begin a, more training on terrorism when this uh, occurred, a conference that has been postponed. We thank you for joining okay, us. Okay, thank you. Now here's Lou. And Natalie, as we listen to Mr. Lucier's rather clinical description of the search and rescue operation which continues in New York. There's another kind of search, a purely emotional search uh, by family members who still don't know what's happened to their loved ones up there in New York. Uh, one of those people is on the line with us now, Naomi Konovich uh, from New York who is searching for her brother-in-law. Uh, Ms. Konovich, what, what is it you have been doing? Um, we started early this morning. Yesterday my brother-in-law Andrew Zucker went to work at Tower 2 in the World Trade Center. Um, the last we heard was that he was coming down the stairs in the staircase, and no one's seen him since. Um, I've been going with a family friend to check all of the hospitals. We went to NYU to register there to check lists. We went to Bellevue to check lists. We even went to the medical examiner's office, and they gave us advice of what to do. There's nothing to do except for make phone calls and just keep going to different hospitals and asking, and we keep passing his picture around and hoping that anyone who saw anything or saw him might be able to give us some information about where he is or yeah. if he's okay. And his name's Andrew Zucker? Andrew Zucker, Z-U-C-K-E-R. And he was on what floor? He was on the 86th floor at Harrison Be at Beach and Harris. It's a law firm there. North, north the or south? Um, south in Tower 2. In Tower 2. And what kind of uh, reception are you getting at hospitals and, and uh, places where you are checking. We've seen and heard other stories of other people in search of their relatives and have uh, uh, been deflected, not necessarily out of uh, any uh, disregard for those right. people, but because of the, the sheer uh, exhaustion of the amount of work that needs to be done there. There's a lot of work. Um, in most of the hospitals when we were in Bellevue, they have crisis counselors set up where they have lists to talk to you and they have lists of people at different hospitals. Um, whether it's an unknown person or in the name of a victim and they're trying to be as helpful as they can but it's very difficult for them. They have their jobs to do in taking care of patients as well as dealing with people who are coming to look for patients. Have you been able to be in touch with any people uh, who may have worked with your brother-in-law at that office? We spoke to one of the partners from his law firm who had seen him who said that if it were not for my brother-in-law for Andrew people would still be sitting at their desks. Andrew went around and told them all that they should get out of the building um, and we spoke to actually his secretary who told us that she had seen him in the staircase and doesn't know anything further than that. That was going to be my question. What kind of a man is your brother-in-law? Because we've heard the stories of folks who engineered the exits of several other people uh, after the first explosions and the call to get out of the building uh, quickly. Would your brother-in-law have been one of those kinds of people? My brother-in-law has a heart of gold. After the first plane hit, he called my, my sister called him. He said, I'm okay, I'll call you back. And then she hadn't heard from him, but he is the sweetest man who would go back in to try to help people. And apparently an announcement was made that the building was secure. So maybe he was trying to tell other people to get out and to move out and that they should keep going. Um, he's the kind of person who would put other safety probably before his own. He's just a very, very sweet man. The, I know there must be others who are in a similar situation uh, to yours. Is there anything you can tell folks who may have uh, been attempting to find their loved ones only to run into a stone wall? The only thing that I can tell people is what seems to be working for us. I mean, we haven't found anything but to keep calling the hospitals to fill out the missing persons report and to bring in all the things they're asking for, like pictures and fingerprints and hair samples, and to just keep doing it. Um, and it's, it's hard, but you've got to keep calling. They're updating lists constantly. Every couple of hours, they update lists at all the hospitals, and to just keep trying and to get his na their name or their picture out there for people to see. That's the only thing that I can help for. Where were you, Naomi, when this happened? I was actually at home. And you? Um, I was getting ready to go to work. And, and how did you find out about it? And, and, and My sister called to tell me that my brother-in-law was okay, but that she doesn't know more than that. 
and that was before the second plane crashed. And your immediate reaction, I can imagine, was one of horror. It was a tremendous fear to make sure that everything was okay with both my sister and my brother-in-law. Well, we certainly wish you uh, uh, good luck and uh, Godspeed. Naomi uh, Konovich searching for her brother-in-law in, -law in uh, New York, where my colleague Aaron Brown is now, with more information on this terrible story. Aaron? I suspect you could take her story and multiply it by 10,000 or more. As we look behind us again, uh, we can't see any longer. Just go ahead and zoom past me here. They don't need to see me now. Uh, we can no longer see building number seven, the third of the buildings that collapsed. Um, I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest, that this is anything more than a shift in the wind. It just feels to me like the wind is, is kind of moving up uh, from the south now. Uh, and this cloud of smoke and dust and asbestos and who knows what else, frankly, uh, moving kind of directly in front of us. In the World Trade Center, of those 50,000 people who went to work there, many of them were involved in the business of money. Uh, analysts, investment bankers, brokers, uh, and the like. The largest tenant, Morgan Stanley. Um, our colleague, Lou Dobbs, the anchor of Moneyline, has been working uh, that part of the story. And Lou joins us now. Lou? Aaron, thank you. As you say, 50,000 people worked in those towers. The tragedy only now be beginning to be counted in terms of human life that has been lost, but certainly there will be thousands, not only in the towers themselves, but in buildings surrounding. And Morgan Stanley, the largest uh, occupant of those towers, is some 2,500 people working in the South Tower in the mid uh, floors, some uh, 11 floors there. Those 2,500 employees have been uh, certainly the focus of management at Morgan Stanley over the past uh, uh, 24 hours. And Phil Purcell, who is the CEO of Morgan Stanley, had some good news for employees of Morgan Stanley and for everyone here in New York today. Miraculously, I'd say, uh, we had 2,500 people in World Trade Center, 1,000 people in World Trade Center 5. Uh, it appears the vast majority uh, got out safely. Uh, we will have some, we have some missing people that we are looking for. We have uh, uh, all efforts uh, trying to track down everybody that we know who worked in the building. Well, that search for other people in that building and the other tower and the surrounding buildings will, of course, go on. And the tragedy is beginning to mount for all of us who work in New York and live in this area. Already we have learned of friends and colleagues who have lost their lives in this tragedy. And as we begin to count the human toll and as it exacts its pain on all of us, we are also looking at a community that is resolved to get back to business as quickly as possible. At this hour, the New York Stock Exchange, the principal brokerages and banks in this town our meeting at the New York Stock Exchange. Dick Grasso, the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, leading that meeting. Their efforts to determine when and how soon they can get business back to some semblance of normal. The desire by everyone I've talked with in this town is that business return to that semblance of normality as soon as possible, certainly tomorrow. But as you look at that devastation behind me, what was once the World Trade Center and all the and the devastation that surrounds it and the pain and the loss of life, there are also some very practical issues involved. They trade $43 billion a day at the New York Stock Exchange, and that huge amount of money also is supported by operations groups, SIAC and DTC, the clearinghouses, and they are in buildings, in part, what was once the World Trade Center, but in buildings surrounding it. And no one knows at this point how secure those buildings are, when perhaps they themselves might collapse. So that will be an important part of this uh, determination that this group of business and financial leaders are meeting to resolve at this hour. Also, uh, is a statement of resolve, the New York Bond Club, uh, certainly the leadership in fixed income in this, uh, in this world, canceled a meeting yes for yesterday, uh, yesterday that would be held tomorrow night. At the request of Lawrence Lindsay, the president's uh, chief economics advisor, uh, they have been requested to restore that meeting and to go ahead as had been planned. So the club will, again, be holding that meeting here in New York City tomorrow. 
And uh, for now, Lou Dobbs in New York.